Um, let's go ahead and get started. It's a little minute past. Um, if you didn't see the announcement, unfortunately, I do have to kind of cut class short today. Sorry about that. Uh, beyond my control, something I have to be at, and they're not going to allow me to change the time. So I'm probably going to dash out of here about 125 or something like that. Um, my main goal is uh, we'll continue on. I might even go a little bit earlier than that, uh, but uh, we'll continue on talking about the. Uh, uh, the end to end example, if people want. Um, although I'm going to start off with the assignment two. So I didn't get that out there. So I wanted to um, at least once kind of show you, uh, we'll go through the workflow a bit. Um, um, uh, we'll, we'll keep talking about assignment two. Um, uh, so, um, but uh, so I want to talk too much about content, uh, just to uh, make certain people kind of understand how this works. The, the workflow is a little bit different from the first assignment. Uh, there is still a GitHub repository, so hopefully that's working. I saw a lot of people already accepted it. That's good. Um, so you should find that uh, uh, invitation link uh, will allow you to create the uh, repository for you. Um, so and if you clone that, like usually I've already got this cloned, it should, if you're using the development environment, it should come up, it should reopen in a container, it should open the, the Jupyter Lab for you, um, so you can do your code in there. A nice thing you do uh, on this one, you're going to have to put some code into some Python script files instead of into the notebook. That was where, that's where I landed on uh, in order to get the... Um, uh, the auto grader and the workflow working. So, um, but, um, but yeah, if you are using VS Code, you can just open the files and edit them in here. It's a lot better of an editor than trying to edit stuff in uh, Jupyter Hub, but you can do it from there as well. So, um, so let me show you how this works. Um, if you start Jupyter Hub, Jupyter Lab, uh, and bring up the assignment two. Um, uh, it should run uh, all the cells. Um, what will be happening initially is most of the stuff is blank, so you have to fill in code still, like like last assignment for uh, a lot of these parts. Uh, but some of these parts, um, so the first one is that um, um, at particular points. Um, I ask you to actually put code into a function um, and it's actually going to call that function and it's going to run tests using the doc test on that function. All right. So just to show you on this first one, uh, so, so the, the notebook ran, but, but when it ran the tests, uh, these mean that they're all failing. So you know it was trying uh, a test where it was expecting that the intercept, if you fit the model, gets this value. Um, and uh, right now, um, it's um, um, returning zero, right? So, so it's expecting that, and it's returning that, right? And it's actually returning zero for all these, right? So um, uh, for this second assignment, you're going to be building uh, a regression model uh, in using scikit-learn and using stats model. So using two different libraries to, re to build the same regression model. And then also we're going to build a classifier using logistic regression, uh, kind of poorly named, but, but we'll build a classifier again using uh, scikit-learn and stats model. All right? um, I'll talk more about that uh, probably next week. Um, so I won't go into the actual kind of details of what you need to be doing, just kind of the workflow here right now. Um, so to get these to work, uh, like I was saying, you could you need to add some code. Uh, I mean, you, you do need to fill out the stuff in the notebook like we asked for. So I'll be looking at both of the notebook, but also uh, at your code in these things and whether you're passing what you're getting in the auto grader and some other stuff for the evaluation. So, um, so yeah, if you want to work on this first one where we have to build a regression model using scikit-learn, uh, you need to go to this file, and, and you could edit that in Jupyter Hub if you have it running. Um, all the source files uh, are in the source directory. Uh, for reasons, there's one separate file for each one of these that you're going to be doing. Uh, actually, there's more than that. So there's a couple of these that you won't have to modify. They just run some tests, but um, um, I'm just going to show this first one. 
So you could edit it in here uh, in order to do your stuff to uh, build a model uh, using scikit-learn. So build a logistic regression model using scikit-learn. And then you have to extract the parameters, the intercept um, and the slopes um, and some measurements and return those from the function. All right. So I could add here, if you're using the environment that we have set up, uh, you could use VS Code, which has a much um, better editing set of features for editing. Um, so for example, um, I could also uh, get that same file here in VS Code, open it up. So uh, I won't show you how to do it. So right now, when you first get it, it just always returns zero for these. So that's why um, um, when you do your initial run, none of these will be passing. Um, and if you look at the results from the doc tests, uh, if you look at them closely, um, um, you're, you'll get the message that it was expecting some particular value and it's getting zero. All right. So of course this won't earn you any points, but you could actually get this to pass by just returning what's, what it's expecting. Right? You need to actually build a model, fit the model, uh, and extract these parameters and, and extract these values and return them. Um, but, uh, but yeah, if I set these all like that, um, these are what are expected. Here, here's the tests that are run uh, on the sign. So it'll be in this file um, um, here is where it will be finding the doc tests that get run in the auto grader. Um, so I can get some idea of, of how you're doing as you make commits and submit stuff, right? So, um, so here, if, if I just hard code these to pass, uh, to, to pat, return back the accepted values, um, if we run that in the notebook now, um, um, I don't think that these will pick up if you just rerun the cell. You have to actually restart the kernel. So if you're editing in the Python file, and if I go here um, and try rerunning the cell, uh, everything's still failing. Right? So instead, what you need to do is do like a kernel restart or just rerun everything. And then it will like reload the Python file uh, with the changes you made. So I, I, I don't really like that workflow, but that's where I'm at right now. I'm hoping to improve on this. Uh, I keep trying to figure out, learn new stuff about uh, using GitHub classrooms and stuff. Um, so what I just did there, if I go back to that, um, this is what you should expect, of course, actually doing the work instead of just returning what I'm expecting. Which, you know, I mean, even if you were getting 100 in the auto grader, I'll still look at what you did and make certain that you're doing it right. Uh, you wouldn't get any points for what I just did there, uh, even though it's passing on these. But that's what you want to get if things are working right when you run it in the notebook is it tries all these um, and everything's okay. And I would encourage you to, to do this incrementally. So if you got this working for task one, you got your scikit-learn model passing at this point. You might want to make a commit. Um, however you did commits before, you should be able to do, still do the same thing. If you're using the environment setup, you can use VS Code inside the dev container. It's a nice uh, way to um, um, access the, the Git functionality to make commits and push stuff. Right, so now the only thing I modified was I, I, I changed those lines in this one file uh, in the source directory. Uh, oh, I reran the notebook, so that's modified as well. Right, so, so, so now my modified, my two files that I modified um, for this first part of task one are in there. So I could um, make a commit, stage them. Uh, make a commit and push it. Um, sync it up. So that's when I'll be able to see it, and that's where it'll run through the auto grader. That'll be my first step on looking how you're doing on this assignment and on the future assignments. I'll try and get all, all of them will be using uh, a workflow like this, hopefully improved a little bit. There's some things on this I don't quite like yet. but um, So what you should see, if you go back to your repository, some things to look for. Um, you should see everything that you push show up on your feedback pull request. So that's the one that I just did right there. Um, what you should see if, if uh, uh, um, 
the most recent commit, if I go back on that real quickly, uh, will get run in these GitHub actions. Uh, that's what I'm calling the auto grader here. So you should see how it did. If you look at the details of the most recent commit, will show up in here. So stuff that is, is happening is still actually running. You can actually watch it run, but you don't have to see it live while it's uh, running the test. You can go back after the fact uh, once it's finished and access it there as well. Uh, but what you should see when it's running um, this part here, so it does some stuff to, uh, this is really using Docker. So this is using exactly the same container environment uh, for the, the classroom setup that I, that I had to use as well, right? So again, if you're not using the environment, um, you, if you have different versions, you might get it working on yours, but when you push it up, you'll see that it's not working, so you need to check that. Right. Although it's more likely to be the other way, you might actually have your stuff right, but because you have a different version, you might end up having parameters a little bit different or something. So it doesn't seem to be passing, but, it, but, uh, but, but if you were using the exact same version of the libraries and stuff and you push it up, you would see that, that they are actually kind of what we're expecting. So, so there is that uh, now that uh, the, uh, the differences in versions might be a little bit more problematic for you if you're not using exactly uh, the setup of all the libraries and stuff here. Um, so anyway, yeah, looking at this, I mean, it actually runs a, a dev, uh, a Docker container, uh, installs Python, and installs the exact versions of NumPy, SciPy, and all the stuff that I think is most important uh, that we're going to be using for these assignments. Um, it does do one thing to check that your notebooks run cleanly. So if your notebook isn't running cleanly, you won't pass this first one. Uh, you lose points on that, but if your notebook isn't running cleanly, there might be other stuff as well that's not working. But this is checking it. This is actually rerunning all your notebook from top to bottom every time you check in. Uh, and then it runs all those tests like I just showed, the same one. Um, I was expecting this to pass, though, so let's see here. Sometimes, was that the old one? Hmm. Look at that again real quickly here. So, so yeah, I put that up there. Let me see if I show on that file changed. <clears throat> so if I look at my files that were changed, uh, yeah, so it's got the code in there. Just, uh, at, just setting the parameters for all those and returning them. And um, so that's useful looking at the, your, your changes that are in your current um, feedback pull request. So this gathers everything you've modified so far since uh, you started the pull request. Um, okay, yeah, I'll have to investigate that. So, um, uh, yeah, if things are working and if you've got it passing um, on your, when you run it on your local and you push it up, you should see it passing here too. Um, hopefully, I'm, I'm, so there, there might be, still be some bugs on there. I'll, I'll check that out. Um, but um, yeah. sure. No, I mean the the yeah the 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 test is it, it runs on my machine and runs here on the GitHub. It, it needs to run in this particular environment, yeah. Um, um, but yeah, uh, that was a little bit unexpected. Uh, that should work. Um, I'll, I'll check that out. Like I said, I'm still working out some kinks, so there might be something that I forgot there. Um, um, all right. Okay. So those are some things to do. I saw a lot of people had accepted the assignment too, so that's good. Um, so I won't go into the kind of details of what to do here, oh, um, but uh, we'll do a lot more of that uh, next week. Um, 
So hopefully people, though, will get started looking at it um, and working on things so you can come with some questions and stuff next week. Okay. I'll keep checking that to, to see. Hopefully there's, uh, hopefully that isn't an issue, but uh, I'm not certain why that wasn't showing up the way I was expecting. Okay, anyway, so let's let's go ahead and uh, go on to some other stuff then. So let me close this off. Continue on with um, talking about the chapter two stuff. So we'll look at the next section here. Um, so let me go ahead and open up uh, the. Um, Um, our class resources. So. We'd pretty much finished up the first notebook last time, which was really about kind of data exploration. Um, so, um, if you haven't done a Git poll recently, um, uh, yeah, last time I had noticed I hadn't gotten some stuff in there, but um, I've got a lot more stuff so the, for the up through week seven mostly uh, is up there and I rechecked everything, make sure everything is running. So you should do a git pull. Um, if you don't have the, the, this stuff, the, the unit three, the exploration, cleaning and training, but also um, the, there's more stuff out there as well, including, um, I'm not going to show this today, but uh, you also uh, because we're, we're actually using logistic and uh, linear regression before we really get into the details of, of, of uh, how of, of what that is and how it works, right? So, I'm, so this assignment, you're just using it as kind of a black box. You don't, I mean, unless you've looked at it in some other class, uh, you don't really know what it means to uh, fit a linear regression. Uh, but yeah, I mean that's um, uh, we will get in kind of the details that, that we will look at linear regression and logistic regression, uh, kind of how it actually works, um, and a little bit of the mathematics behind it, that kind of stuff. But um, um, uh, for this assignment, uh, I'll, I'll probably do this uh, Tuesday next week. Um, there is also a fourth notebook, um, kind of with the similar kind of things you have to do, but on a different data set in there. So you can you can start by looking at that. Um, and I'll talk about that next week. So. Um, okay. So, in the rain, remaining about 30 minutes or so, um, um, let's look at this. Uh, yeah, that was all running cleanly, I think. Yeah. Um, so this one, you have to do a little bit of this in the, uh, the second assignment. So this class isn't really about data analytics, um, um, but uh, so a big part if you actually went out and got a job like that is people spend a lot more time on the stuff that we, that we talk about here in, in the first part of the assignment, the, the clean, the getting the data and the clean and exploring and understanding it, that, that usually is a, a much larger amount of time that a real working data scientist uh, spends their job on than uh, actually building models doing machine learning stuff. So, um, so it's important in that sense, even though it's not really the primary focus of this class. So what we're looking at here, the, the middle part of the chapter two of the hands-on machine learning. Um, is a little bit of some of the typical stuff you might have to do to get data ready to actually uh, uh, create and fit a model on it. Right? Um, so 
So we're still using that housing data set that we looked at last time. Um, we've already read it into a pandas data frame. Um, so um, yeah, so there's one section about um, what's known as splitting your, your data set. So this is kind of an important step in machine learning. Um, and uh, I'll just, um, the what we do when we fit a model to a set of data um, is, is, you know, we take some features, uh, we're going to do supervised learning for the first part of this class. So we take some features, we have the target, so we want to build a model so that if we give it those features, it will give the output that we're expecting for everything we're training it with, right? So that's what supervised learning is. The problem is there's this, 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 this idea of overfitting. So if I have a set of data, um, some models in particular, uh, you can train them so they will uh, always give perfect answers for the data they're trained with. So that's a type of overfitting. What that means is for the input data, they will give exactly the right answers for all that input data. Right? Um, that may or may not be a problem. It's a problem, though, because the way that you really want to use a, a model like that, that, that we're using supervised learning to, to fit, um, is we want it to make predictions on new data, on data it wasn't trained with. Um, and if it's overfit, um, it will be bad at generalizing. All right? And that's a, that would be a big topic of this course. When, uh, um, we'll talk about overfitting versus underfitting and what you can do to fight overfitting. It's always a battle for supervised learning uh, to get your model so it generalizes well on data it wasn't trained with. Okay, so this is a big problem. So the, the first primary way that we battle that is if we have a set of data we want to build a model on, we might not build it on all the data. We might split the data in half or typically we split it into like about 80% we'll use for training and we'll split off 20% or something like that. We'll hold that back for a test set. Okay? So the reason why you do that is um, um, you can train it on just that 80%. You can evaluate, uh, like then if you feed it back in and say, okay, what is the accuracy? How well is it doing per, on predicting on the data set that we trained with? Uh, it might say, it might get, be 100% accurate. So it might do really well, but that's not a good measure of how well your model is doing. A better measure is, okay, here's some data you never saw before. How accurate are you on predicting that data that you weren't trained with? So, you know, that's, it's common. I mean, not only common, you'll get yelled at if you don't do this, if you're trying to fit models. You really, the, the real question is, how well does your model perform on data it wasn't trained with? Right. So you have to always split into test train sets, um, um, uh, and sometimes we'll want to split into actually further, uh, uh, more than two sometimes. So, um, so yeah, there was a section in Chapter 2 uh, that was really a little bit before some of the stuff that we talked about last time, but um, um, uh, we have it here. Um, the, the simplest, there are functions in scikit-learn that will do this for you, which you probably want to use those functions. Uh, but you can easily do basic splits by hand. Um, so there are a lot of subtleties on this. So, so um, um, yeah, let me talk about a few of these. I'll let you guys, uh, you should, of course, read the textbook uh, to get a lot more of the details of these things. Uh, but uh, for one, uh, you always have to be careful when you're splitting. Uh, so here's a common thing on a lot of data sets. You might find if I have a data set with 100 items, uh, and maybe it's a binary classification, it might be that the data set is sorted. So it might be, so my label is like yes or no, but it might be that all the yeses are in the first 50, and then all the no's in the second 50. So if you naively split like 80%, your test data, your, uh, your test data, so this is my 20% test data, is all those. It's not, it's not indicative of the actual data you want to train with, which has a even split of yeses and no. You'll get a bad model if you do that. Right? So, you know, you certainly have to be, you don't want to, you want to, don't want to naively split like that.
especially if you don't know if it might be sorted. But even so, even if it is kind of um, um, a bit mixed up, still just splitting like that, you might get a bad sample. So you have to think about the data, um, how representative, representative it is of the model that you want to fit it to, which is, uh, uh, the, this chapter goes into that a little bit. All right, but you know, the first thing you can do to fight that, uh, like if it is sorted, you could just shuffle the data and then do your split. So yeah, I think this was the first example from the uh, the textbook where we're building a uh, a split by hand uh, of some data set. All right, so you know, Scikit-Learn has functions that does this, and even more sophisticated. We'll do like uh, splitting with sampling and things like that, um, which uh, we will be using, although not on this assignment too. Uh, but later on, we'll have you have to do some splits where you uh, split uh, and keep samples of um, um, uh, keep keep the the things in your samples um, uh, about equal. So, um, but here, yeah, I mean, uh, just to kind of show you uh, what you can do. So we're really just using we're expecting this to be um, something that um, can use indexing. So both pandas arrays and numpy arrays can use that kind of in uh, the, the not indexing um, um, uh, slicing can use slicing uh, by indexes. Right? So all we're doing here is we we, uh, we we take a ratio, but we use that to calculate an index. So if we say eighty percent, uh, or I guess this is supposed to be the test ratio. So if we say twenty percent, uh, we calculate. Um, um, and, and take the first 20% of the, uh, kind of the opposite of what I did here. So what we're really doing in this function is uh, based on the ratio, we calculate the index, which would be like 20 if we have 100, or 90, yeah, 20. Um, and we use that for our test data, uh, using a, a 0.2 or 20% test ratio, and then the rest becomes our data that we train. That, that's really what this function is doing right here, since it's, uh, this calculates the index uh, based on the amount of data, the, the number of samples that we have, what index splits it, uh, 2080, or whatever the ratio is that we ask for. And then, then we just do slicing, right? So we take up to that index for our test data, and everything after that index to the end becomes the training data. Right? Although notice, um, um, so I skipped over, so we, we were, uh, we're using some fancy indexing here again. So this, this is Good that uh, that if you understand uh, the way like NumPy uh, and pandas fancy indexing work. So we we take um, uh, all the indexes from zero to the number of, of items, the number of rows, number of samples that we have in the data set. So that should give us an array from zero to ninety nine. If we have a hundred here, I should use zero indexing here. So if I have 100 samples, we can think of them as index from 0 to 99. Um, and, and it, this permutation just shuffles them up. It's like sh shuffling a deck of cards, right? But now that we have that, we've got a list of indexes all, I know I've got every index just one time, but they're all randomly shuffled up. Uh, but um, uh, doing this here, you know, so we, we take the first 20 of these that are all shuffled up, um, um, and, and this is this is really doing some fancy indexing. We're passing in an array of integers, so so just those uh, indexes uh, end up um, uh, being pulled out from there. Right? Um, anyway, uh, um, um, that, that's you know this this is just more NumPy kind of stuff, but that's what's happening here in this example. Um, Yeah, I don't know how much of these issues I want to go into. So sometimes it's important that you always get the same data in your split, right? So if you have to reproduce, uh, I mean, you can either just split it once and somehow save that test and train data, or you can do things to ensure that you'll always get the same shuffle or whatever, right? So that, that's what's being discussed here, where we set the seed to try to make certain we get the same shuffle uh, each time that we do this. Um, a 
okay, yeah, I don't want to go into the details of all that. So um, uh, maybe the final thing I'll mention, because we do use some stratified sampling uh, later on, is um, sorry about that. Um, so things, a lot of the stuff we do in this class, we don't need to be this sophisticated. We can just do a fairly naive split, train test split. But, you know, when you get out into the real world, uh, things get more complex. You have to worry about issues like this. So a good illustration is uh, the things talked about for stratified sampling. So again, knowing a little bit about statistics and, for example, uh, polling, right? So if you know about polling, to get an accurate poll, you have to be certain that the people that you sample are representative, right? So I need to get the same kind of population and stuff if I want to sample for voting for the election coming up. Uh, if I just sample all people, white people in a small town in Nebraska, I might get a very skewed poll from what I would get if I get a more representative sample of the, um, the population that's going to vote, right? That's really what's being talked about here. So when you're doing a train test split, you might have to worry about that, am I getting a good representative sample in my training data to build a, be a good model? If, if I do a split and I happen to get over sampled of something or under sampled of something else, uh, it might affect the performance of the model that we create. We might not end up with a very good model. Um, and yeah, this is trying to show that. So for our housing um, data, I can't remember from the rest of this if we do use a stratified sample, but um, uh, but but yeah, if we were worried about that, if we're going to build a model of this housing data, remember we're trying to predict the uh, the it's a regression model, but we're trying to predict the um, uh, the, the 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 house price. Um, so, uh, oh, I, okay. In this case, I guess uh, the the example from the textbook, um, they're saying that it might be important that uh, we have the same uh, relative uh, representation of different levels of income to build a good model. Right. So here's one way of visualizing that um, 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 we could uh, bin or label uh, the uh, the income. Uh, using different bin sizes, so we had uh, about a little under a thousand had um, median income by that measure between zero and one point five, and so on. Right. So this is just a histogram of the stuff. So if we think this is important, when we do our trained test split, we want we would probably want to make certain that our training data has roughly this exact same histogram, this exact same proportion of people in this income and this income and so on. Right? So that's kind of what we mean by stratified shuffling is that um, uh, based on the measure that we think is important, we can tell or we can build a splitter that will maintain data that has the same um, uh, distribution of important measures or, or measures that we think are important. All right? um, but yeah, I mean, I would never try to build something more sophisticated like that by hand. So you know, uh, Scikit-Learn. We'll we'll be using Scikit-Learn a lot in this class. It has all kinds of methods for train test splitting um, uh, that allow you to um, um, uh, do these kinds of sophisticated um, um, splitting, including splitting by some measurement. So in this case, we say. Um, The important thing is here, um, um, I can't remember the, the for loop, what we're doing here with the for loop, but um, um, basically by setting it up using the stratified shuffle split, uh, the second parameter here makes sure that the, the, the data has that same distribution um, as is showing in, in this housing income category that we pass in as the second parameter. Um, all right, and we can kind of prove that. So here after the split, um, um, we can count up the proportions. So, so we're showing some, uh, some pandas, some, a little bit advanced panda stuff here. So we're, we're kind of coming up with the counts and dividing by the, the size of the, um, uh, 
the original housing set and then the test set and the train set um, and you know these numbers won't be exactly but they should be roughly equal meaning that our, our um, uh, test and train set have the same distribution of the income category after we did this stratified shuffle here. Um, okay. So yeah, so let's look at uh, let's move on. Let's look at the the, the, the data cleaning um, stuff. So you do have to do a little bit of this on assignment two. I ask you to uh, fill in some uh, fix some missing data for uh, one part. Um, and uh, make something a categorical variable is another uh, thing you have to do on the assignment too. So, um, uh, yeah, the most common things, um, the, the, the biggest problem is, is always missing data on real data sets. Um, so, um, yeah, no data set is perfect. And in the real world, you're going to get things that are really a lot, lot more messy than what we ever were work with in this class here. So you have to do something about data that's missing or data that's incorrectly entered and stuff like that. Uh, if data is missing, you know, uh, we could do some brute force kind of stuff. We could just drop everything that has a missing feature, just not use it to train it or model with. But if we have a lot of stuff missing, you, you're throwing away a lot of data that you might might be able to use. Uh, to build a model with, right? So that can often be a bad. Right? So that, that's kind of this first thing: is any if any feature is missing, just get rid of that whole row. We won't, we just won't use it. Um, this one is probably so to get rid of the attribute or get rid of the feature. So we're talking about getting rid of a column. Again, you know, you're throwing away something that might be potentially useful, but if that column doesn't look like it would be useful anyway. That might be an obvious thing to do if it's got too much missing data. Um, um, but yeah, if it's going to be useful uh, and too much is going to be relative, right? So if only 50% is, is uh, of the data for some particular measure is filled in, I mean, are you really going to be able to, to fill in that missing stuff in a way that actually helps you build a model, right? So, so but yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know what a good rule of thumb would be, right? So if, if you've only got 10%, you know, maybe it would be useful if that feature is going to be useful for building a model to try and impute the missing values to fill them in. If it's 50%, it's probably kind of not not useful. It's, it's going to be hopeless. You, you won't be able to, to impute good values for all the stuff that's missing. You don't have enough information uh, to, to make that feature um, useful. So. Uh, but yeah, assuming that we think it's important enough um, and there's not too much missing, we might want to do something to actually fill in those missing values. Um, so what I ask you to do on the second assignment is just to, to, the, the, the easiest thing to do is figure out what the mean value is and anything that's missing just fill it in with that mean value. Right? Um, so that works okay as long as too much isn't missing because you know if it's missing the mean should be the closest to what the actual value is uh, of, of that missing value than any other thing, right? Um, there's other things you can do. So yeah, if you ever get into like Kegel or other stuff, or doing real uh, uh, data cleaning like this, you might have to build a different machine learning model to try and predict what that missing value would be based on other features. So, so some things that are really important, you might want to take the effort to uh, uh, try and come up with a value that's more reasonable than just filling in the mean or putting a zero in there or something like that for the missing value. Um, anyway, so yeah, I would use, I would always use pandas if I need to be doing stuff like this, data cleaning, imputing missing values, things like that. Um, I'm sorry, pandas or scikit-learn. Scikit-learn has the, the 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 nice things for uh, imputing and things like that. But um, if you're just going to do something simple, like drop the rows or drop the columns, you can do quick uh, things in pandas to do uh, that kind of stuff. Um, um, if you just want to fill in the missing values with the mean, you don't have to necessarily 
do uh, uh, use a, a more sophisticated one, but I do ask you to use a scikit-learn imputer instead of doing something simple like this for assignment two. But um, but yeah, you can fill in missing values at the mean, relatively simple, some, something like this. Uh, so you calculate the median. So we're, we're taking the particular um, uh, feature, the particular column that has some missing values. Uh, we calculate the, the mean, we're replacing with the median instead of the mean. Subtle differences for using one or the other, but it might make more sense to use the median sometimes or sometimes use the mean depending on if there's a lot of outliers or things in the data. Um, but yeah, so once we calculate that, um, uh, we have nice pandas things for telling us uh, which in that feature, that column, which ones are missing uh, and fill them in with a particular value like the median here. So uh, I uh, hadn't, hadn't rerun the cell, so before we did that, the, uh, the uh, total bedrooms, um, um, was a little bit, it was missing, so if you look closely, you know, it only had 16,354, where everything else had 16,512, so it was missing a couple of 200, uh, less than 200 uh, values in there. Right. So if we fill it in with the mean, I don't know if I have to rerun this, but uh, I have to rerun this. So rerun everything above that. So if we re rerun this, but uh, uh, uncomment that, so we're actually filling in those missing values with the median. So, uh, yeah, I need to, to should, should pay, this, this is an aside, you should pay attention to warnings. Definitely don't suppress those. Uh, I've had people on assignments going, you can suppress warnings in scikit-learn or pandas by, by setting a parameter. Uh, but, uh, you know, I mean, sometimes you can safely ignore warnings, but they're usually telling you something that you shouldn't be, uh, I, I should fix the code, so this, this is not really safe to do anymore, the way that we're doing it to fill in the missing values. Um, I talked a little bit about this before. We, we probably need to make a, a real copy of the housing uh, um, uh, data frame before we do this to get this warning to go away, away. Um, or do what it suggests here. Uh, using doing it in place would probably be another hop. Oh no, I did it in place. No. Uh, anyway, so so after we do that, no, we don't have anything missing anymore in our um, housing data frame, including the total bedrooms we just filled in with the median value there. So. Um, all right. Um, but you should use the uh, use an imputer from um, scikit-learn instead of doing it by hand for the assignment too, just so I can see that you uh, kind of learn how to do these kinds of things. So, so scikit-learn has a much more sophisticated uh, things for imputing missing values, but the, the simplest is uh, in, in, imputer just means you know uh, making up or, or inferring uh, what value uh, to, to put in uh, to a missing value, right? But so you can use simple strategies, mean or median or zero or some hard coded value to, to fill in any missing things. So um, so yeah, the, the way these work. I, Next week, I'll talk a little bit more about the, um, uh, the API for the scikit-learn framework. So you'll see this pattern used a lot, though. So if you create an object like this uh, imputer, um, basically, um, um, you'll give it some parameters, but then you'll do a fit uh, on some input, and it will return um, um, uh, that you do a fit transform is the the basic API for a lot of these. Uh, what are they called? I'm going to draw a blank. Uh, but, but a lot of, of objects in um, Scikit-Learn work this way. So you first uh, fit is kind of is building a model. So you actually do that when we're building like a logistic regression model, uh, and then we transform. So so once we've figured out the parameters for the imputation. Uh, we can transform that. So in this case, the transform after we we fit the imputer, if you pass in 
uh, a data frame, it will fill in the missing values with the median. Uh, so the result is a new data frame that we renamed X with the, with the values uh, 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 set to the median um, that were passed in there. So yeah, I guess the, the reason why I had these all commented out is we can do the same thing using the imputer um, um, in the next cell below here. So let's run everything above that. Um, create our imputer. Um, so here, um, this will fill in a missing value for any column. So basically what came out of here was the median value for each one of the features that we had. So if anything, if, if anything was missing from these others, it would use that to, to uh, Fit in. in fact, you know, this simple strategy, the median should be the, um, the same as the 50th percentile right here. So for longitude, it was one, one, negative 118.51 and so on. But that's all that happened with the fit is it figured out the median value, our strategy for each one of the features. If we actually perform... Um, If we actually perform, do a transform um, now, um, yeah, the result from a lot of scikit-learn stuff, even if you pass in a pandas data frame, it'll give you back a plain NumPy array. Sometimes if we're still doing cleaning or exploration, I, I still want it in a pandas data frame, so you might have to, like we just did here, uh, we took the result of that and we got it back into a data frame by re, uh, recreating a data frame with those values and redoing the, uh, the, um, the names of the features, the names of the columns here. So, so passing those back in. But yeah, so the whole point of that though is, is like I was showing before, is it did the same thing, right? So the only stuff we had missing uh, in this example from the chapter was, the, was some values in there and now everything is filled up. So we, we filled in the median for everything that was missing. Um, right. um, oh, uh, yeah, I had a section here. I don't know if our textbook went into this, but um, talking a little bit about this API. I should be familiar. The, the API is a little bit of a function, functionally oriented kind of way of doing things, uh, but it's also object oriented. So um, um, uh, we will be using this a little bit for some of our assignments. Um, so yeah, there are three, uh, these are the names I was trying to remember. Um, um, so it's got these three main kinds of things, estimators, transformers, and predictors. Um, so... Uh, we, we do use some examples of this below here. The, the textbook uses this in here. So we will be uh, actually creating an object uh, and using this idea of duck typing. Uh, so if it, if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, you can treat it like a duck. That's kind of what happens here for this API. So we can create something that has the basic methods of a, um, of a transformer uh, and, and pass it in or use it in scikit-learn anywhere it expects a transformer. Right. Um, so the, if you did, if you filed the textbook or this um, lecture notebook, you'll see an example of that coming up next here. Um, so I, there was one part in the second assignment where I asked you to make something to an actual categorical variable from the attribute uh, which. Um, came in as a int or as a string. Um, so we're showing an example of that here. Another kind of uh, so another kind of cleaning you might do is re-encode stuff. Um, so yeah, we mentioned this on Tuesday. We've got this this variable that probably would be very useful just uh, on the idea that things near the ocean probably have high, so, so communities on the ocean, the, the house prices are going to be higher, so we want to predict higher 
uh, house price, uh, median house price, and things that are further away uh, would have lower price. So we probably want to have that, that attribute. But um, in order to build models, machine learning models, you have to give numbers as input. You can't really handle strings, right? So, so at a minimum, we have to do something with these that are all coming in as strings or actually objects, which is kind of the default. Uh, when, if, if pandas reads in something from a data frame, it does not handle, handle it'll just uh, do it as this generic object. Um, so you know, if you don't have scikit-learn, uh, an easy thing you can do for something that's categorical is I could just assign an integer to each one of these. So I might say uh, inland, replace that, everything that's inland, replace that with one, near ocean is two, and so on. And that becomes categorical, and it's an integer, and I can actually use an integer in a machine learning, like scikit-learn, to build a model with. Right. And again, you can do that by hand, but um, um, there's lots of stuff that will do that sort of um, uh, encoding of, of, of a variable like that, re-encoding it as a number um, in useful ways. Um, um, right, so we showed some of this before. Um, um, this is kind of telling us our categories and sort of what the relative uh, uh, numbers of them are of, of things that are on islands versus things that are far away from the ocean and stuff. Um, So that, that basic type of, of uh, encoding of an object that's categorical into an integer, you can use a basic ordinal encoder. Um, and uh, yeah, you need to use this at one point for assignment three, something like this. Um, so this, uh, this will just arbitrarily um, uh, assign an integer starting with zero for each one of these categories. Right? So if we, if we go off and, uh, oh, the, you can do the fit and the transform in one step. I call it fit transform. I think behind the scenes, scikit-learn just calls fit and then calls transform. But, uh, but yeah, it's just a convenience method for doing both of those steps. Um, So uh, we'd actually pulled out that column into a separate data frame. So just that one feature is now in this data frame called housing category, right? Um, so when we fit and transform, re-encode that using the order null encoder, uh, we've, we've still got just one column, uh, but now everything's an integer. Everything's a number, right? Um, Um, and and uh, we can I can tell the 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 encoding that happened. So the I, the first ten items before we did the encoding, it was island near ocean, uh, inland near ocean inland, right? So inland got uh, encoded as one, uh, near ocean as four, inland near ocean, so on, right? So that's all it's doing. Again, you could easily do something like this by hand, but there's more sophisticated kinds of encodings. Um, uh, that you can do from scikit-learn. But it would use the same pattern if you want to do something more like a one-hot encoding or other stuff like that. So. Um, yeah, so let me just finish up uh, this here. Um, so this actually uh, um, uh, does encode this as a categorical variable. So, so these are the integer representations, but uh, it, it's really a categorical type. Uh, so here you can tell that, that you know, um, what, zero was associated with that category, one with that inland, two, three, four with the near ocean, and so on. Um, and I can't remember if I forced you to do this on the time of two, but sometimes the order matters. You'll get better models because uh, um, um, you, Sometimes the, the, the category, there's no relationship between one and the other. But, but sometimes there is a clear relationship. Uh, so in this one, there might be a relationship that from near to far, far to near. Right? So, so being on an island, being near the ocean is more similar to being on an island than it is to being inland. Right? So there's, there's, a, uh, there's a natural ordering. So when you have an ordering like that, you probably want your categorical variable to be encoded using that ordering. It will help 
when you're fitting a model, if you're using that as a feature. Right? So that's one thing you can do with the ordinal encoders. You can tell it uh, that, that I want you to encode in that order. So it should end up with, with island as zero, near ocean as one. Um, so, you, so yeah, now the second one was near ocean. Um, so that get, got encoded as a one. Um, two, three, and, and inland got encoded as a four, and so on, right? Um, and yeah, if you look back at the categories, it should be that order that you asked it to give. So, so zero for that one, one, two, three, up to four, right? Um, and um, yeah, I've kind of run out of time, I need to run, um, but um, so yeah, I'll stop there for today. We'll pick up, um, there's, there's some subtleties. Uh,